welcome Jenny. I'm so glad you can be here so we can talk education, so we can talk about getting children involved, all of the exciting things. Thank you for having me, Arthur. <laughs> And I know we were talking before we hit record button, like usually happens. I mean, with you said quite a bit, but the, the main thing I think, and that's what I want to expand on with you, because you have this amazing way of making learning approachable. And I know you've shared a lot of the different projects. What can we do in manufacturing? I know we both have machining backgrounds, but this, this could be applied to any trade. This could be applied to electrical welding, anything really that's, that's a hands-on kind of skilled job. Right. Where do you see we're failing right now or where do you see that we could do a better job? Well, I think first off, we need to rethink how we're teaching in general. I think that, you know, back back in the day, it was one thing to make one, two, three blocks and they're very dead, you know, dead nuts useful um, in the trades. I use mine all the time. Yeah, very practical. Very practical. But when we're going to have to start students younger. And the reason being, by the time they're in their senior high school year, they've already chosen their career track because that's the track that you're good at English, you're good at art, you're good at engineering, you're good at, you know, this is the track you're going to go down. And if we're going to get them interested in making things and realizing that the trades are not some dirty, gross, nasty job, they're actually high tech. And it's kind of like playing Minecraft all day, you know, in some, in some aspects when you're talking CAD CAM. But then in other aspects, it's kind of like playing arts and crafts in a way. I always tell people, like, I feel like there are times that I'm almost like, I don't want to say a god, but at the same time, being able to design and create and make things instead of just sitting in front of a computer, sitting in front of a phone and having information fed into you, being able to interact with that information so that it makes sense. Because I know you and I were talking earlier about we both sucked at math yeah. in high school. Well, we thought we sucked at math. <laughs> oh, I was and, terrible. And we're both machinists. <laughs> and I think it's because the mathematical <laughs> concepts were no longer problems on a page. They were a challenge. They were a problem to yeah. solve. There was more critical thinking involved. And like you and I, yeah. I think a lot with my hands. And I think there's a lot of students that we are missing because we tell them, you know, if you want to be successful, you need to learn how to code or you need to learn how to be a business administrator. Mm -hmm. And I think we're trying to throw those students that <laughs> because they're smart, oh, this is the only track for you, and they don't realize it takes a great amount of intelligence to become a tradesman. And I think our value to society is yeah. quite high, and I'm very, very concerned because there's less and less of us. Yeah, and that's that's why I want, I'm working with amazing people like yourself to try to bring more of these conversations out there because the the, the like, that end we're working towards is one where we don't have enough people in the skilled trades. And that's a world where we buy more of our things from overseas, but that also means we're making less money as a nation, which it does not paint a very pretty picture. And I would like to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> and really not to be but like doomsday it, girl yeah. here, but if we were to close our borders, if there was a war, heaven forbid, and we don't have people who are going to make things. I'm sorry, but it's, uh, how are we going to defend ourselves? How are we going to live our day to day when we don't have people who can repair things, people who can fix things, you know, it's going to be old folks like me and our little home shops, like cranking out parts. And I mean, I'm loving it, but at the same time, I don't think there's enough of us that have the practical experience to try to carry it on. I mean, it's one thing to have fun with everything you're doing, but also recognize that if we keep going this way, you know, we're more likely to end up in a future like that movie. Have you seen Idiocracy? I can't remember yeah. if I've asked you before. Great. But flip. You've seen that movie. Anyone that hasn't seen it and you're watching, go look it up. I don't want to. But the future that movie paints is, is kind of where we're kind of projecting right now with the lack of skilled trades workers in north america the inability to to build things and so let it's just that inability to, to to create and then you pay there's a lot of problems with that right like you end up paying more for the labor that is there because there's less of us so we get to make more don't get me wrong i am a big fan of being worth more money i'm not against that but when you're trying to bring work back from overseas to be able to manufacture more here the more we have to pay per hour per person, the more expensive our products become, the more of a barrier that becomes to bringing work back. 
I'd like to see us normalize and kind of equalize. Some shops are still keeping that equal and there's some shops that are paying like 50% over market rate for my machinists right now. I just had a friend that left from British Columbia up here where I am to go down to California for almost 200 grand a year because it was like a 60K a year jump for them. And they were like, yeah, I'm going to take that jump. Right. <laughs> well, because nobody can find machinists, you know, it is the whole um, supply and demand thing at this point, which is kind of why a year ago I started Run Twinch Works because I get calls from companies and schools saying, hey, we have a new technical educator or we have, um, you know, our machinist just retired or just quit and we don't know how to run the equipment that we spent, you know, half a million dollars on. What are we going to do? And so, you know, it's great for me because they can bring me in and I can teach them how to run their own equipment and on site and I leave and hopefully yeah. I leave with them in a much better place than they were before. But at the same time, it's really dire because we don't have people who have that experience. And uh, I think a lot of it is because we are yeah. using antiquated methods too. I mean, there's a lot of really, really good training programs, but there's also a lot of certification programs that focus so much on the theory that we're forgetting the critical thinking component. Here, we're gonna give, we're gonna tell you about feeds and speeds and formulas and everything, and we're gonna expect you to retain all that. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but part of the reason that I'm in this field is because I like working with my hands and I don't do well with lectures at all. And I feel like we are, <laughs> you know, we're boring people out of the trades in some points. And I think, I don't think it's intentional, but in a way yeah. we're kind of gatekeeping people out when you're teaching people machining and you're like, oh yeah, then you got to drop it a thou and you got to set your work coordinate system and you got to do this and this and this. And I'm like, you know, maybe you remove the jargon. It's like I told you, Arthur, like I can watch movies in French yeah. for about five or 10 minutes. And then I'm like, all right, I'm frustrated. I have no idea what they're saying. And maybe I should have taken French, but I didn't. And here we are. <laughs> and I just think in order to keep people's attention in a world where our entertainment is 30 seconds to one minute TikToks or YouTube shorts or videos, we need to find more creative ways of explaining how things are done. And there's no reason not to change it because anything you want to learn, you can yeah. either get in a book or, you know, on your phone, on your computer. So yeah. And you've also put a lot of work into creating projects that are more approachable for younger people that are a little more fun, something they can actually carry with them. I. I love machining. I don't carry a one, two, three block in my pocket. Right. <laughs> well, when you think about it, it instills a sense of pride, right? When you make something, you're really excited when someone says, whoa, that's really cool. And you say, thanks, I made it. You know, I mean, there's kind of this really cool, yeah. like that sense of pride, like, dude, I made that. And I think that's addicting, especially there are some students that might not be great at writing reports or math problems or that kind of thing, but when they have tangible success, something that no one can take away from them, you made that and it's amazing. And so what I'd like to steer around, I like to start with simple projects. Um, inexpensive projects typically would because not every school has a massive budget. Um, a lot of my projects, I buy my tooling on Amazon so that if people want to make more and they're yeah. on a small budget, I'm not pricing them out. I mean, I. Personally, I'm a Harvey Tool girl, love Harvey Tool, but I know that's not in everybody's budget. They are nice tools. So like, here's a project <laughs> that I made, which is a portable, because I've noticed students like absolutely love anything with their phones. If you can give them accessories yeah. for their phones and make them customizable, either with an epoxy inlay or wood inlay, or, you know, you can get as complicated or simple as you want. It's just a profile and a sl slotting program. And you know, they carry it around in their backpack and then when they want to make their TikToks and charge their phone at the same time, they can put it on their little Viking chair and we got a little slot for the line. <laughs> and, you know, the students, you can carry, I carry this in my backpack for when I travel. So when I'm at the airport, if I want my phone yeah. up, if I want to watch the time so I don't miss my flight or whatever, I'll set it right there. It doesn't take up a lot of space. So I use it too. But the one thing I noticed is with younger students, especially if you could give them something on their phone for their phones, this is one that I made when I worked for my last employer. Um, inside it has a little yeah. channel. It's a three piece block. It's actually three pieces of wood. This one has an acoustic channel and you can actually change the acoustic channel so that you get more bass or treble. Oh. So it's science. 
I'm I'm all about That's anything so that cool. you can weave all the different um you know, the different STEM um STEM fields into. So if we can do yeah. science, if we can do some math and make it fun. This one's just it amplifies your phone. So I stick my cell phone in the hole and it amplifies the sound. But it's great. Kids love that kind of yeah. stuff. And I try to make all my projects customizable. And I think that's really important for students yeah. because, you know, maybe they want to, you know, they want to put their name on it or maybe they want to put a cool Marvel comic, you know, logo emblem on it. You know, they can they can do that and it pushes them to want to learn more. So you're kind of tricking them into learning more by saying, well, if you want something really cool, I want you to kind of think about how you would do this in in the real world. So that critical thinking yeah. piece is really important instead of there's so many curriculums where you sit people down with the manual, you lecture at them for a bit and they say, OK, for the next four hours, I want you to go step one, step two, step three, step four through this really, really dull like tutorial. And the problem is if a kid's never been behind a yeah. machine and you're telling them to program, how are they going to relate what they're learning here to what's out there? So typically what I like to do is introduce people to the equipment first, then crash it. So then they see me, they can laugh at me, but then they realize like, oh my gosh, she crashed the machine and everyone's still alive. It's okay. You yeah. don't get people past that fear and then say, okay, these are all the cool things you can make. And I think, there's a lot of really good YouTube channels right now that are doing very similar things. Um, I absolutely love John Saunders. Titan does an amazing job. You know, there's yeah. a bunch of really great ones, but I think I, I kind of like to go one step even back from there where I'm kind of like, okay, you can do this. I always joke that I'm the Bob Ross of machining because I'm like, okay, we're going to have happy little accidents, but if we can count 10 by the end of it, we're all going to be kosher. And I think a lot yeah. of it is in industry, we need to be more visible. We need to be working with schools and we need to show them that this is amazing and fun. And there are so many careers, you know, you're not stuck behind a drill press all day. If you go to school for machining, you can do programming, you can no. do tool. I mean, I'm a tool maker by trade. I love it. It's like making a big complicated 3d puzzle, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But yeah. there's a little something for everybody in it. And I think right now visibility and then showing them you can make really cool things. I mean, you might go to a job where you're making widgets for part of the time, but you're making a really killer paycheck yeah. and you're going to take all those skills and they're going to stack. And the more you can stack skills, the cooler stuff you can yeah. make. So. Okay. I just, because you, you're, you're talking about so many like awesome things and I don't oh. want us to gloss over them. <laughs> Right, I, I, because like when you're talking about crashing, like you're the first instructor I have ever heard that's like, oh yeah, by the way, I start the class by crashing, you know. I've had, I, I've been in classes where I've seen instructors yell and scream and get mad. I, I've been in in classes and training over the years where they have lectured us about the dangers of crashing and how to avoid it, um, but I've never been in. I've never had an instructor that's like, okay, guys, we're going to start by crashing so you can see there's no big deal, and it's, then we can kind of get on to it. It's a controlled and, crash. And I do want to get back to the... Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure you're not doing something that's going to yeah. you know, need precision grinding and all kinds of crazy alignment stuff. <laughs> right. But, I mean, it's, it, to me, but it's a good way to break that, the ice and get people comfortable. Yeah. Well, and that is something that I know that I was terrified of doing until the first time I did it. So I love that you get it out of the way. And then each of the projects you're talking about, it really showcases like one of the things that I love about manufacturing, which is the problem solving mentality. I want this thing. Okay, well, now I'm going to figure out how to make it because I want this and I'm going to find a path towards it. So then I've got a problem solve. Okay. Either I go to the instructor or the books or the tools or the whatever, I find my path forward. Right. I think I just, I, that's what I love and really appreciate about the projects you're sharing so far. And I know you've got the super awesome wallet and I want to hear about that one too. Okay. <laughs> then I could talk about the fact that the first workshop I did this, I saw three of the guys that were in my workshop the last time I was in Tennessee and they still have theirs and use theirs. So that made me feel really good. And they're like, and yeah. I made it myself. And these That's are, awesome, though. These are adult men. Like, these guys are in their 50s and 60s. And the fact that they ha have an RFID yeah. wallet is, to them, like, 
and nobody can scan <laughs> my credit card information, you know? And I don't know, it's just kind of explaining. And again, it's got that science, like explaining how the copper actually deters anybody who tries to scan it, like how it, so yeah. you get to talk materials and all that, so. And it, again, though, you're always bringing that approachable, like solves a problem kind of mentality that at least in the, the training I got to take while I was still machining, right? Like it was sorely missing. It was a lot of memorize this, don't do that, do this. And that was about it. Like right? you're finding all of these great ways to connect with, okay, I need this, so I need to do this. And then it just seems like learning would be so much easier in a, in a program that's laid out that way. Well, and that is honestly why I don't have an outline I don't have a manual. I don't have a book. I'm not going to be teaching everybody yeah. step one, step two, step three. I want them to think about the process. So the first thing we do, we crash the machine. But we talk about things like why we home the machine. What is the machine really thinking when we're homing it? And I always, okay, I always liken it to the day after Drinko de Mayo when I had too much tequila. And I said I wake up the next day. <laughs> now, I don't say that to school children as much as adults. But they, no. they it usually elicits a giggle. But I'm like... When the machine wakes up, it doesn't know where it is because stepper motors are dumb motors because they receive a signal, but they can't convey back. Whereas when you're talking servos, those are closed loops, so there's a conversation going. But stepper motors, there's no conversation. So, But I think once they understand like why you home the machine, you really start to understand like the work coordinate system, machine home versus part home. And, but you don't have to use all the fancy yeah. jargon. You don't have to say, okay, now we got to set our G54. And it's kind of it's kind of a pet peeve of mine when I see people teaching that way. They're like, all right, now we're going to go on to work coordinate systems. And first of all, that sounds boring as heck. Um, and then, oh, yeah, it's based off the Cartesian yep. coordinate system. And then I got PTSD from when I was in math. And I was like, oh, my gosh, big words, you know, like. And then you realize it's not that hard. And I don't know why we don't break it down a little bit more. And, you know, you're, the terminology is going to come. You drop somebody in the middle of a foreign country, yeah. eventually they're going to learn how to ask for the bathroom and beer. But, you know, like here yeah. with machining, it's something if you throw too much at it, it, it's overwhelming for everybody. There are times where my brain has to stop and tick, tick, tick. What is this called again? And, yeah, I think... The first thing we really need to do is we need to get manufacturers out talking to students working with students and bringing them in as well you know I, I feel like there's not enough tours and not enough uh, kids who are understanding how things are made you know everybody I think everyone's like oh man it'd be really yeah. cool if I could make that and if if you tell them yeah you can and they're like well it's complicated if you can show them that it's not complicated that's only going to encourage them to want to learn more I think we need to do it in yeah. microbytes well <laughs> Bring, yeah but and it's it's making it approachable meeting the learner where they're at instead of like you said gatekeeping with all these big terms and you're not providing a pathway for the learner to take could could you imagine if like when babies were born instead of trying to get them and teach them how to sit up and how to stand and all of it we just said okay start running right okay kids start running and that was the way we approached mobility for children like any parent watching is like, oh my God, no, that would be stupid. That'd be okay. terrible. But the, there, and there are some programs, you know, I know you were sharing about a school that's near you that has reworked their curriculum to be more approachable, more fun and engaging. Oh. I don't know if you want to give them a I, shout out. Quick. I do. So Cardinal Manufacturing and Oliva Strom. <laughs> and actually I know a bunch of the guys, Craig, the instructor, most amazing guy ever. Um, and I know um, a couple other gentlemen that I know had a hand in it. Dan Conroy, Matt Goose from um, MRS Manufacturing up there. They work with the students, but it is really unique. And I love this because it has the critical thinking part. And it's not students just all working from the same blueprint, cranking out the same part, being bored. They're actually bringing industry members in from the community from other manufacturing plants where they bring the engineers to sit down with the students and the students are actually making parts that are filling work orders um, for some of the job shops so if it's a job that hey we have 50 of these widgets but you know it they might not have time or bandwidth or maybe it's just one that they're like hey we want to give this to the students the students log in every day um, soft skills is a huge part of the program so they have to be on time. I mean, they're yeah. they're very much run like a machine shop. 
you have to apply your junior and senior year to work at Cardinal Manufacturing. And it's neat because they're mm. learning, but they're learning from people in industry. So they're getting a real feel for what it's going to be like. I also appreciate it and wish they would have had something like that when I was in school because I went to school for journalism originally. <laughs> And I did go a full year, and then I was like, I just can't. <laughs> and now here you are. <laughs> I, I just couldn't I couldn't sit behind a desk all day. It was just making me crazy. And anybody who knows me knows I'm a pretty high energy, and I'm like, I grew up on a farm. I loved working with my hands, and I just really wanted to get back to working with my hands again. Yeah. This program allows the students, because they have a marketing department, they have a purchasing department, quoting, they have like the whole nine yards. So students get to try different areas, and they might be surprised to find that there's an area they never even thought of. And the cool thing is by the time these students graduate, almost all of them, I think pretty much I haven't heard of anybody not having a job when they left school. But not only that, all those, um, those two years that they're working at Cardinal Manufacturing, they take, the, they take the money that the students earned from the jobs because they're actually doing jobs for members of the community. And it goes into a scholarship fund. And the students leave school with hmm. money for college or trade school and most of the time they already have jobs lined up yeah. within their local community so especially really nice for those small communities where you don't want people to leave now i left my small community i love you holla yeah. clear lake but um i i do love it down here in deforest <laughs> um but you know you a lot of these smaller communities are trying to keep you know they want to try to keep some of the students there to fill some of those roles and um, if you start a relationship with those students, even if you come in on career day, I mean, I know people talk about career day and that's that's cool and fine, but being able to work hand to hand and being able to explain to them the thought process in making something, having an engineer or a tool maker sitting down with the student saying, oh, I like this design, but maybe we need to rethink the fixturing. And they're working hand in hand, doing the things that we do as machinists and engineers, which is a lot of the times you're working with the team and you're collaborating because not everybody knows everything. I don't believe anybody who ever tells me they've never messed something up because that means they're either lying or they're not working hard <laughs> enough. And so it gives them an opportunity to see like, you know, test out different roles, but then also work with members of their community to find out if this is a fit for them. You might be surprised the students, like people yeah. were shocked when they're like, wait, you love to write. Why aren't you going to school for journalism? I'm like, I just, it's not my thing. I need to make, I need to build stuff. I need to break things and build things. And that's to me how I understand the world. Yeah. When, I, when I'm making stuff, everything just yeah. makes sense. Whereas if I'm sitting here staring at a screen, I could stand there, you know, salivating and, you know, I, I, <laughs> most of the information just kind of bounces off my, my noggin if I'm taking it passively. And I think yeah. a lot of our learning right now is so passive. And I think that we're missing out on the students who are really good at their hands or artistic. I know I mentioned to you, like the one thing that people, yeah. I know when I was in school, it's like, okay, you're a good writer. So this is the bucket you belong in and this is your career path. <laughs> and, but you know, if I would have told my guidance counselor, I think I want to be a machinist. I think he would have said, what the heck is wrong with you? Why are you like, you know, holding yourself back like that <laughs> without realizing well, like I am 10 times happier making things than I would have been with a college degree. I just think yeah. this allows me to create. I'm definitely more of a creator than a competitor. I, to me, the world just seems right when I'm making things. I get into my flow state. I enjoy showing other people how to make things. I kind of really enjoy it because it, it makes it, I, when I get to see that light bulb moment, I kind of get a big dopamine hit because I'm like, oh, they're finding their superpower. It's kind of like when you watch your kids stand or yeah. take their first steps and you get so excited and then they're excited and you're excited and then they fall. But then all that momentum, it's like, it's okay, get back up, we can do this. And watching people like all of a sudden when all the pieces start coming together and they're like, oh my gosh, I understand this. Can I program the next one? It's like, yes. And then as soon as you start seeing them like understand, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, they got it. They got it. it. To me, there's like nothing more fun than that. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I get to relive my first part <laughs> every time. But I feel like we're yeah. missing a lot of the students that we're trying to silo into another position. We're, we're trying to say, okay, well, you're really artistic. Well, so yeah. you're going to, these are the, these are your options. I think we need to stop 
saying that. <laughs> Let them explore the options. You can be artistic yeah. and technical and, you know, and have a trade job. I know some of the best trades, yeah. some of the best welders I know. I can't weld a lick. Okay, I can tack weld. It's not pretty, though. But some of the best welders I've ever seen had <laughs> have kind of a creative stint to them where they, you know, they, they're able to lay that bead down just so beautifully. And it's you know, it's equal parts intelligence and art. And, you know, there's just, there's so many aspects and people don't realize how fun it is. Well, it's so much fun. And the thing is, is like when you're talking about buckets, that's something that I don't, I don't know how we got where we are, right? And I don't know if that's super important because where we are right now, we don't talk about trades. Guidance counselors will tell you to pick anything besides the trades. Maybe it's changed in the last 12 months, but before that I checked, it hadn't changed. They try to steer you away aggressively from the trades. And it's like, it. I, I think back to my father now, he's passed, but he was he did welding. He went at, by grade four, he went to a vocational school, a trade school, whatever you wanna call them. I know they still exist in some parts of North America. I think they're awesome. And it's it's a way to allow children to explore especially when they're not having fun sitting in a chair, sitting still, staring at a blackboard all day. I, I was one of those kids. I had, there was no vocational schools left for me to go to by the time. It, it drove me nuts to sit there in a chair. Yeah. I wanted to do anything. I loved shop class. I loved all the different shop classes. It didn't really matter which one. The computer sciences, again, because I was programming and I was playing with stuff and I was making circuits. Like, so when you're talking about all the joy you get from creating, I feel that <laughs> very much so. But it's also, we, we just, we, we did away with so many other ways to, for children to learn and to get their skills. Um, you know, 2020 saw a rise in homeschooling because people were just sick and tired of the kids sitting there and staring at a computer mm -hmm. screen. And they're like, there's gotta be a better way for my kids to learn than just stare at the screen for eight hours a day. It's killing them. I'm watching them come apart. Mm -hmm. Like, so I don't, going forward, it's like one, there's the Cardinal Manufacturing that's near you, which is awesome. I would love anyone watching to like, drop in the comments if there's more places like this, because I would like to talk to them. I would like to talk about them. I would like to bring more attention to them because I think that's absolutely fantastic when you're talking about their program. But I would also be remiss not to bring more attention while we're here talking about this is the skills competitions. Now in Canada, they're a little more prominent, but I didn't hear about them till I was almost 30. But we have skills competitions by province up here, and then we have a national skills, but there's also a world skills. And I know some of the states have schools that do it, but skills competitions at least up here, we have them in exhibition centers. We bring the K through 12 students through. The hardest thing is trying to convince the schools to get their kids there. But once you convince them, every booth kind of sets up little try a trade kind of sample booths and, and kids can get their hands on. I mean, everything from estheticians doing hair, makeup, construction, forming, concrete. Like I want to bring more attention to that because I think that side is a good pathway but a lot of the outreach that skills does right now is only in the seniors in high school. And Jenny, like you pointed out earlier in our conversation, by the time our, our seniors get to high school, most of them have already picked a college. Most of them have already picked a career path that doesn't include manufacturing. So how do we get it into the, like the younger grades, the before high school grades to, to let them know about this beautiful world that's given me a life I absolutely love you as well. I mean, you, you could be writing right now, Jenny. Would you rather be out writing an article right now? No, oh, have you seen my shop, <laughs> dude? This is like my play area. I'm yeah. like, I wouldn't have this if I was a journalist. It's a, it, yeah, I am totally jealous of your shop. One day I will have a magnificent shop like that. It, Today, my, my shop is a, it's an office, but. <laughs> it didn't start out like this. It started like an old garage with old fluorescence, you yeah. know, grease stain pavement i put the epoxy floor and put that thanks to youtube i mean there are opportunities to learn thanks to youtube <laughs> um yeah but you know and it's funny oh, because sure. people said well you can't teach kids like little little kids machining and i'm gonna say you're wrong because <laughs> at 
Uh, so wrong. Well, I have a little trainer mill back there. Her name's Helga. I don't know if you can see Helga back there. She's just a little okay. tiny trainer mill. She is about 30 pounds. I can throw her in my Nissan Juke, and I can take her to schools. I'm trying to find the part I made. I don't know where that one went. Um, but when I'm working with a younger, younger group, so I was in Racine with another really awesome organization, the Professional Women of the Trades. Um, Kadia Burns heads us up, and it's a chance to work with, like, urban students and students who live in um, areas where they might not have as many opportunities to get exposed to this stuff but I'll bring it and I've had kids as young as three years old jogging the machine again it's I use yeah. wood like we make little like that's a little lotus necklace so I have different designs all load up oh, nice. and the kids can flip it over yeah. put their name on it we just put it on double-sided sticky tape and I say okay we're gonna we're gonna make the tool yeah. kiss the top of the part just blah, you know and kind of explain yeah. because the machine doesn't know what it is but now we're going to show it and then i will have them i'm like okay let's turn the thing and i mean if they bang into it it's wood again most of the time they might ding it up and we got yeah. wood cheap but i've had little little kids like come up and you know like they're, they're very excited they want to play with the the chip brush they want to play with everything but they're also really fascinated and you know those little kids when that part gets done they're so proud and they want to show everybody. And oh yeah, I had a student come up to me. Well, not a student anymore. They're an adult now. Probably about three or four years ago. That said, hey, you were at a STEM day and you made me a dog tag. Dog tags are another really nice, simple way to get oh. kids. I still have the dog tag. And he pulled yeah. out his keychain and there's the dog tag. <laughs> and I mean, it was like five or six. He had graduated high school and he goes, I, and he's actually going to yeah. school for machining. And to me, though, awesome. you know, that's when you know you're making an impact, which is, again, maybe, you know, it's a, it's a little yeah. bit of a guilty pleasure. But I absolutely love but hearing that I was a, able to help other people find a trade that they absolutely love that they wouldn't otherwise know existed. But in order to do that, too, we really what? need yeah. to help and tech ed teachers. <laughs> Bad. Yeah, well... And that th this, if there's any education teachers that are sitting there like, yes, but I don't have the budget. They won't give me the budget. I feel your mm -hmm. pain. I want to find more resources to, to reach out to you guys because I understand that what Jenny and I are talking about here, this isn't like a, oh, oops, let's just flick the switch the other way. That we're, we're having this conversation and I would love for everyone watching to share it because it, we need more awareness about this. Like things at a, at a municipal level, needs to change so that funding can actually go to support these programs um it's not always just you know school zones being greedy no they're putting their dollars where they think it's going to make the biggest difference for their students kind of like jenny mentioned you know the bucket thing they're like well but at some point in the 90s 80s they decided that trades students were the bad kids so they stopped putting money in that bucket at least up here and it, it's it's that's not actually the case but someone started a wild rumor and here we are and all the trades funding has been pulled away. I've talked to trades teachers over the years that, that cried because they were forced to auction off their equipment because they couldn't get money anymore to stay and be educators because they had to feed their families and they felt so guilty because they weren't able to take the job for so little and do anything with no funds to actually impact students and they had to leave like so this isn't like a, a little flip the light switch everything is solved kind of situation but it's one i think and like you talked about earlier jenny that we need to have more of in industry it's not just industry it's not just schools it's not just parents it's everyone coming together to just talk about the differences that are available in the trades versus a standard desk job um there there's a big difference of, of things that you can do i mean when you're telling me this person pulls out a dog tag like six years later out of their pocket they're like you helped me make this and now i'm gonna learn how to do this like that is beautiful that's like that that's a sign of making a difference for somebody and, and showing them something possible that person could have ended up miserable as a salaryman at some finance company if he never would have come across and, and made a dog tag all those years ago right you never know
Well, and but it's amazing where you can make an impact because you mentioned a lot of the skills competitions and even things like FIRST Robotics. Yeah. So this last year was my eighth year mm. doing the CNC shop uh, for FIRST Robotics. Oh, you've been involved with them too? Oh, I love it. I've been drooling over their stuff from a distance. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> honestly, okay, I'm not, I'm not supposed to have favorites, but honestly, FIRST Robotics is absolutely one of my favorite events that I do all year. Um, there's a group that I do. It's uh, the Seven Rivers um, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and students from all over. I have the coolest job in the entire place, which is I bring my machines, and um, when the students break their parts yes. during the competition, they'll bring me a piece of metal and say, can you reproduce this? And I need it in like a half hour. So, and it's, but it's so amazing because I've had so many students that are like, can I watch? I'm like, yeah, come on down, you know? And so trying to explain to them what I'm doing, I say, yeah. you know, okay, we're gonna, they brought in parts where they didn't have models or prints. And then I can show them things like, if you go to McMaster yeah. car, you can download that same part, but we need it right now. We're gonna make it out of aluminum as opposed to ABS. And so I show them, we're gonna download it. We're gonna do a quick tool path. And then I just kind of show them a real quick and dirty. So it is kind of quick and dirty. It's not like, okay, we have all this time, yeah. but it's like, okay, let me show you why it's so cool to be a machinist. Cause if you need something, you just make it. I actually just got yeah. a 3D printer and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this thing is like crazy fun to run. Like, it's just so simple. <laughs> But, you know, showing them the subtractive side of it and explaining it, that's the other thing. With, with like, tech ed teachers, think of all of the tech they have to know. When I was in, you know, high school, yeah. we had small engines, we had welding, and we had woods. And that was about it. You yeah. made a birdhouse and yeah. a picnic table for your squirrels, and then you welded a pe couple pieces of metal together, some artistic sculpture, and then you would fix uh, Briggs and Stratton. And that was you know, kind of the, that was tech ed. Now teachers have yeah. to know everything from AI to robotics, to CNC lasers, plasma tables, you know, mills, lathes, you know, the, the list goes on, everything they have to learn and it's exponentially growing. Yeah. And the only way we're gonna be able to, first of all, keep teachers, don't get me started on how they deserve a lot more money. Um, but if we're gonna keep yeah. teachers, we need to, as an industry, help support them because the one thing I've noticed that in industry, if I need training, a lot of the times I'll get it. It really just depends on what the priority of the boss is. Now that I'm the boss or the wench, I you know do my own thing. But um, <laughs> so and I love I'm I'm working yeah. on some some crazy stuff that maybe in a next time I'll show you. Um, <laughs> But, okay. you know, there's just such a variety of things and so many ways to interest students. So there's really, it feels like we're kind of standing back on our haunches, trying to teach them the old way that we learn. And it's just not going to work. You can't hold their attention span like you used to either. It's nothing against the kids. It's just that the world is such a fast paced, pace, uh, fast paced place now that you can't sit there and spend a full semester on metallurgy and then take your time and then the next semester talk about feeds and speeds and how the metallurgy pertains to the surface footage for a minute. I mean, the kids, you're gonna lose half the students there. You've gotta make it fun, you've gotta make yeah. it interesting, you gotta make it applicable. But then the other thing we're gonna have to do is these students are only in school for eight hours. So what we're gonna have to do is start tying in things like science and math into some of the tech stuff. You know, you have technical science, again, not to beat a dead horse, but you and I both sucked at math, or we thought so. It was a perception thing, yeah. though, too, because <laughs> it wasn't that we sucked at math. It's just yeah. that the way that we were learning it didn't stick in our brains, not the way, and, you know, we're all a little different. Thank no. goodness. Because yeah. <laughs> we can't all be machinists, yeah. either. I mean, but if everybody was that cool, the world would... No. <laughs> <laughs> It just collapsed right. in itself. It can't be all that yeah. cool. Yeah, it's the but black hole it, of coolness. When you're talking about it, though, I think that it, it's just it's it's looking at project based learning. And now if there's any homeschooling parents out there that are on the project mentality, they would get this right away. So there's a whole world in that. I don't want to. But it's from that world where it, like raising your children, you give them age appropriate projects and they discover the skills that they need to accomplish the project as they're going. But if we apply the same thing to trades and then we start pulling in the science when it makes sense and we start pulling in the math when it makes sense, 
not right away because like you said it's kind of boring up front but if we bring in the math and the science to explain after a failure or after they hit a stopping point where they're stuck then that would completely transform just the way we can bring education and it makes it a lot more fun because you can use learning opportunities then from different students that have different stopping points in their projects so it's not like you're you're focused only on learning from the one student but you look at it and it teaches you know more of the project-based learning more of the, the the group thinking around a problem as well my brain's going to take off in a million different ways on that but i really like what you did there and you've demonstrated it with your rfid wallet with the dog tags with the little phone amplifier you've consistently demonstrated that this learning actually reaches students we just need more people to to see the awesome and contribute their own versions of that to make interesting projects and with projects like the rfid wallet like um, it was a simple one. We did the programming and everything. I did 12, 12, 10 or 12 students in three days. But, you know, we have aluminum. So we have materials, too. Mm -hmm. We have aluminum. We have copper. We do drilling, tapping, countersinking, profiling, and slotting for the stock band. And, but there's one missing yeah. component that I love the most about this. Now, I didn't do mine, but, you, you know, I had everybody um, engrave some custom DXF they wanted on there. To yeah. me, the coolest thing in the world is when someone's like, whoa, I really like your wallet or I really like your X, Y, Z and saying, thanks, I made it. Yeah. And watching people go, yeah. you made that? How? And then, you know, then they're stuck with me because I'm a Midwesterner. So the Midwest yeah. goodbye already takes about two hours. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, my gosh, they have no idea what they just opened. And they're like, how did you make that? And I'm like, OK. So I take an end mill. But, you know, it's an opportunity to also introduce people who don't know what it is. My mom, I love her. Bless her soul. My mother is the most sweetest lady in the world. She still tells people I'm a welder. I'm like, mom, I'm a machinist. And she goes, well, it's the what? same kind of thing, right? She goes, it's metal. Well, because, you know, my mom, we were far. She, Dad and I always worked out in the shop. My mom's a bright lady. But I think she's now starting to get it. But for the longest time, she goes, oh, yeah, and Jenny, she's a welder. I'm like, Mom, I'm not a welder. Don't tell people. Nothing wrong with being a welder. But then people expect me to be able to lay a pretty bead and, you know, not have to chase it Yeah. with, with the grinder afterwards. But, yeah. you know, there are people that they've never been exposed to it. Well, yeah, I, I, I had a girlfriend for four years, and she just told everyone I was a mechanic because she couldn't wrap her head around it. And she's like, yeah, but you work on stuff. So you're a mechanic. Mm -hmm. I was like, but hun, you're a mechanic. I'm not, yeah, I get that too. I'm like, mechanics <laughs> so your mom, fix the your, things, your mom's not alone. we make the things. <laughs> and, you know, but that is something if you're, yeah. you know, that also shows where we are as a state in our country, where a lot of people don't realize how yeah. things are made, you know. And that's not just the metal things. We're talking food and everything. I mean, agriculture is important, all, all the things. But yeah. it feels like we are so far removed from it. And I honestly, and I know this is my opinion. I have not done testing on it. But I do um, thoroughly believe that's also why we're having issues with mental health in this country. Because this is how a lot of us spend our day. Or this. Yeah. You know, and I'm like... It's all passive. Yeah. It's all like there's so much being pounded into us. Half of it just kind of ricochets off into the, you know, the universe. But, um, you know, you don't have anything to tie it to. Yeah. So to me, like when I when I'm having a really bad day, I want to be in my shop because it kind of allows me to have a little control. But it also allows me to kind of get in that decompressed flow state where I'm thinking, but I'm not being slammed with stuff you know this way i'm actually in my own head for a while yeah. i'm not listening to i mean I, I do listen to podcasts of course but um you know yeah. it kind of allows me to kind of tie everything together and we also talked about uh you and i about you know muscle memory yeah. so when you're learning a concept for me it's yeah. a lot easier for me to remember a concept when i'm fidgeting or like you, you doodle i mind map a lot oh, of yeah. the times so, yeah. you know, like when I'm listening to people, I am listening, but I might be drawing a stick figure, you know, that's fishing that, you know, and the next thing I know, I have this big tableau, but yeah. it's, it's also how I remember things because to me, when my hand is busy, it's actually like syncing up with my brain. And I do think there's a lot of kids like that. And now you hear a lot of people talking about ADHD and all the, you know, and I mean, 
big shock. I have ADHD, but I, I had that when I was like seven or eight and I don't talk about it because back then it was taboo. And to me, I'm still like, I don't want to be spazzy Jenny. Yeah. Um, but I mean, but it was also like when I'm, when I'm really involved in making something or um, learning with my hands, I don't fidget. I, I'm usually because it kind of allows yeah. me to, does that make sense? And I think there's a lot of students like that. And I think we're... Oh, yeah. It, yeah. I think there's a lot of people like that, period. I mean, I've met people that have changed their careers to manufacturing, machining a lot of the times because I know a lot of machinists and I was in distributor sales for a while. So I met a lot of machinists. You know, I met a lady who was in her mid 40s who left graphic design after 20 something years to become a machinist. Yeah. She was tired of sitting at a desk and staring at a screen and being told she's wrong a hundred times a day without anything to make. And so she switched. I think she's, she made the switch like two years ago now. She's loving every minute of it. I, I check in here and there, like, especially because this is a shop I went to fairly often. And it was like, she's like, oh, it's great. I learned this this week. Or, oh, it's great. I learned this. Or, oh, it's great. I learned this. I got to help her build out her first Minitoyo set of like precision measurement oh. instruments because she was like trying to build her own set. And we have a local trades program. Um, it's Women of the Trades or something. I'm probably butchering the name, but they help women who are stuck in careers they don't enjoy or, you know, they're returning to the workforce after their children are getting older and they help them find a career in the trades and they help provide funding for training and for tooling and they get them work placements. So I got to work with her through all of that and she loves it. You know, um, I, I didn't start thinking I was going to go into the trades. I started out in computer sciences. I, I came to the trades by accident. We've got Jenny right here with me and, and she started out thinking she was going to be a journalist. Yeah. Like it, it's, it, I really do though. And again, we don't, it's not like we've, you and I have run some study on this that we can prove it with tangible like numbers, people that make things and have a creative outlet. Some people, I think we talked about this before we started recording. They're like always on that hobby kick because they've just like, they got that itch. They can't scritch, yep. but they're trying to find something they can do where they feel that sense of completion. But it's like, I think there's so many people and children obviously included in this where they would love to just make things and contribute and have a measurable impact. And yeah, intellectual pursuits have a measurable impact, but it's a much different way of measuring it. There's not that immediate, like the RFID wallet. Hey, I made this right. like, Hey, yeah. see my new wallet. Yeah, it's cool. I made this right. Mm -hmm. Like there's no moment like that. Whereas like, if you ever end up up here and we go driving, there's a bridge we go over. I made most of the parts on that bridge. Right. It it holds like hundreds of thousands of vehicles a day. I made the pivot pins. And I bet there's something I made that sparks components in and you braces. when you think about that, when you're driving over and it's like, hey, parts that I made. You I know. tell everyone. I tell everyone I drive over that bridge with. I'm like, hey, did I tell you I made parts for this bridge? Yes, Arthur, you told us. Okay, but I made the parts. Like, there's... There's just, it, and it's not an egotistical thing no, where I'm better than you. I'm just super proud that I've made things that are contributing to the world around me. I used to make landing gear for 747s. Right. Well, but when you think about it, and this kind of gets into like the work thing as a whole, but not only did you make those things, yeah. nobody could dispute the quality of your work or the quantity of your work. These things are quantifiable. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody else has been trapped yeah. in a job. I had a job um, where I was behind the desk doing technical pre-sales engineering and everything, and I was kicking butt. At least my customers were happy, I was happy, but the only person who could actually determine how good I was doing was my boss. And, you know, it, yeah. it, it's very different. Like, there's a different feeling like, okay, I made this, you can throw some mics on it. It is 100% spec. Here's the surface finish guide, you know, and nobody yeah. can dispute that. And I think in school, I think everybody at least one time in their life had a report that they were really proud of that they turned in and the teacher turned back and said, this is crap. And okay, maybe the teacher didn't call it crap, but you know, <laughs> it, it's very, um, 
objective. Yeah. So, you know, so a lot of these yeah. students kind of struggle because maybe they have a teacher who's like, yeah, you're really bad at writing. And, you know, they keep getting all those Ds and stuff. But when you're able to make something, nobody can say, well, I really didn't like your short story or your prose. You give them this part, you measure the part, nobody can dispute the fact that this is a good part. No, you <laughs> might mess it up, but then, you know, you start again. But at the same time, it's something like when you're in a job, when you're in machining, at, there's nothing like making molds. There's nothing like that final blue off where you put the high spot blue on, you slam it down, <laughs> you open it up and yep. everything is blued off perfectly. And you just, I mean, again, you stand back and you're yeah. like, darn, I'm good. And to me, I think that's healthy. Yep. I think that a lot of the times when you're tied to a computer, and I'm not saying this is not me dissing corporate jobs at all. I hope it's not coming off like that. But there's no, no, some no. of us where no. there's nothing quite like looking back and saying, man, I did that and I feel good. And it's just never a feeling that I could get in a office role where even even like I love programming. But personally, I'd rather set up my own programs. I'd rather run my own programs than I have for most of my career, like done my own CAD CAM. And I, I didn't do the mold design, not a mold designer, but I did do the CAM and I also did all the setup and everything. And I'm like, to me, there's just nothing quite like being able to stand back. I don't know, it's that pride. It's that sense of accomplishment. It's tangible yeah. success. And I think well, yeah. by not having students have that, you know, it's that whole shop classes, uh, Soulcraft, that that book. I'll send you the link. It's amazing. Yeah. If anybody's into that, it, it yeah, please do. It's it's a very good book, but it does talk very much about our need to make and create, and how a lot of people are missing that right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, like you said, tying it into mental health globally, at least in the Western world, I don't think anyone would dis disagree with a statement where mental health is on a continuous perpetual decline. And if we could save the children and the youth from a future like that and have them find careers that they find rewarding and not just the careers that they're told are good careers, but, you know, ones that they can find their freedom of expression, whatever that is, you know, whether they're, they're welders or machinists or engineers or whatever. I mean, you were talking about Cardinal way back. And the thing about them that I loved is, is that they ex well, ex 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 um, expose, yeah, <laughs> that's the word. Um, they expose students to all the different areas of the business that it takes to run a manufacturing company. Right. You, you said, you know, including marketing and other things, because the world, that's what I love about the world of manufacturing is if you find something like, say, I am a really big fan of making mice, right? Like right. I love moat. I want to make the world's best mouse, whatever. I can find a way to be involved with this mouse, even if it's all plaction injection molding and robotically assembled, I can still find a way to be part of the manufacturing process, either in the testing or the design or the, the, the dye making or the marketing or whatever, the durability testing, the non-destructive testing, the destructive test. There's some way to be involved with, with anything. If I love water bottles, I could get involved in the manufacturing of the world of water bottles, right? Cars, whatever, whatever the venue. Um, I mean, look at the rise of like the EDC, the everyday carry kind of oh, community yeah. where people are making knives and pens and be because these are people that love making things and love seeing others enjoy the things that they've thought up in their brains and created with their hands. There's a whole world of possibility that doesn't leave your children having to go to jobs they hate and drinking away their lives. Right. Okay? <laughs> and spending sixty to eighty thousand dollars for a field that they felt pressured, but there's one more element too yeah. that we've really got to change parents' minds. Now I think this next generation has yes. shifted a little, but I know I mean when I was younger it, you didn't even joke about going into the trades because that meant that you were just giving up on life <laughs> and which never made sense to me and to be honest I didn't start in the trades I mean I started in 99 I graduated in 97 but I started in lasers and yeah. I didn't go for tool and die until I graduated in 2009 for tool and die I decided I needed that sheet of paper because that sheet of paper was going to get me in the doors of the places that I wanted to work um, but I was a single mom at the time, and I think it's yeah. great you are talking about that program for, like, women and stuff. Um, I think there's a lot of underemployed people yeah. out there that, you know, that 
you don't necessarily have to be a teenager in high school you know you could be in your early twenty's and then go man i don't know what i want to do with my life but maybe i don't want to bartend the rest of my life or i don't want and there's nothing wrong with bartending i did it for years that's what paid for my schooling no. but you know there are some people who are like okay i'm kind of burnt out of the service industry what can i do how about machining because you don't have to talk to people unless you want to um <laughs> That's not completely yeah. the case, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think trying to get other people interested. More so I, less. <laughs> and I think YouTube's doing a really good job. You know, yeah. there are the John Saunders, there are the Titans, there are all, all of these great Blondie Hacks, love her. Like, there are so many great channels on there that are starting to get people exposed to it. I just feel like you almost have to be looking yeah. at it in order to find it. So I have friends that reach out and they're like, Jen, since I saw your yeah. YouTube channel, I had no idea what you did. I just said, she does something with metal. Like all my friends are <laughs> like, you just, you make wrenches, right? I'm a tool maker. Yeah. So a wrench is a tool. Well, no, it doesn't quite. So then, you know, I'm like, all right, let me explain this. But, you know, like even the people that, you know, even my close friends and family, a lot of them don't necessarily understand, but thanks to YouTube, we can kind of like show them a little bit more. But yeah, I think as far yeah. as education, though, we, we've got to break that mold of um, a formal curriculum because we used to be able yeah. to cram a bunch of students in there and talk metallurgy, feeds and speeds, surface footage, all that. And now it's just, I, I almost feel like it's better if you just kind of, you know, when you were a kid, how'd you learn to swim? Did they pick you up by the armpits and drop <laughs> you in the, in the lake? Uh, my, my uncle threw me into the lake, yeah. I mean, I think a yeah. lot of the time before we even do CAD CAM, before we do anything else, get them out to the machine so they can visualize things as they're designing it. There was for a yeah. while there. It's getting better. Exactly. Well, and it's getting better, but I know for a while there, there were a lot of companies that were struggling finding engineers who knew how things were made. And I realize that sounds insane, but a lot of them had not had the hands on. Mm -hmm. So you get a print and you're like, this is not manufacturable unless we throw it in the EDM or this is not, it's like, what do you mean? I made it. So, yeah. you know, do it per spec. And then I think it's this reality slap where it's like, okay, but it's going to cost about four times as much because we're going to have to use special tooling or special equipment. And if it's just a flourish yeah. or something aesthetic, that's always the big gotcha. They're like, well, I like the way that looks. I like that radius. Do you need that radius? Or, Hey, you can't have a sharp corner here because when you heat treat, it, it's going to crack the thing. There's, there's so many like elements people don't realize that are involved with it sorry i yeah. went off on a tangent <laughs> there's oh that's okay but you're right there is so much and the whole engineer one we're just going to put a, a little lid on that for a separate oh. conversation because that's a whole other can of worms and uh. don't get me wrong i'm not beating up on engineers i oh no it's a love-hate thing i mean they need us we need them yeah you know it's exactly we all are part of the same ecosystem and i've worked with yeah I, i've worked with a lot of great engineers and i've also worked with engineers that i've asked to quit companies because i was tired of redoing their blueprints so i mean I, i've worked with both sides <laughs> and i think a lot of it depends if your world's still living only in the theory part you know um when i was doing first yeah. robotics one of the teams had a shirt i loved and it just said it well it worked in the Veracut. And I kind of giggled because I've, I've worked with programmers who've never actually set up a machine tool or they might have in school, but that was about it. And I'd be like, um, hey, yeah. dude, I need you to like repost this and I need you to, I don't know, add a clearance plane. And they'd be like, well, it worked in the Veracut. And I'm like, yeah, it's not going to work in the machine. <laughs> but, you know, it's that whole, again, being in <laughs> silo, we all work together. I think that's the one thing you learn mold making, though, yeah. is to learn to work as a team because you have to because everything has to fit perfectly together. So, Te but yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll pick yeah, on engineers not work to, in another to just one. start siloing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and the main thing there, again, with engineers or with students or with educators or with all of what we've talked about today when it comes to the changes that we see as being necessary is it's not like we're pointing the finger at someone else and saying, hey, go fix it. It's just, hey, we all need to come together and work on this, yeah. That, that's the main thing I want to end on. I do want to throw out a call to everyone before we stop recording that I know I mentioned this to you, Jenny. I am working to try to bring more a panel of people that have done education for manufacturing for the trades from different angles to try to put something a little more tangible together. I don't know if it's just a pipe dream right now, but if you're watching this, 
and you're still here at this point, you're definitely interested. So just, just send me a DM on LinkedIn or on YouTube or something. Because if you stuck around this long, there's, there's no way around it. Um, Jenny, did you have any requests or final things you wanted to share with everyone before we finish today? Man, no, I feel like I probably talked y'all's ear off. So it's hard because <laughs> once you get me started, I, I'm awfully hard to turn off. But yeah, I mean, I think we just need to get together as a community and try to figure this out. Like there are different things that we can all contribute. And the thing is, it's great for us machinists right now because we can ask for top dollar, but at the same time, we're all going to be in real big trouble as an economy if we don't have people to follow us up. I mean, I'm getting, I'm not that far off from retirement. I'm 45. I don't think I'll ever retire, but yeah. we, need to, we need to see some more young blood in there and we need to get them more interested and just trying to find ways, whether it's project-based learning or, you know, just machining stuff in public. You know, not saying, okay, go wheel your mill out to the Piggly Wiggly, but... <laughs> but it, it, you know that's not a terrible idea? I've had, uh, I've You've actually had this machine at, at a bar, like... at a microbrew. We, we were doing... Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we brought it for a STEM event and a fundraiser. So, and we, we actually put it on a forklift. Oh. It was right down the road from the company I was working at, and we lifted it up. We had to remove the doors. And oh. I couldn't have my beer till after the event because, you know, you're not running a machine tool and drinking really, really good craft beers. But <laughs> not, not uh, a great yeah. idea. You know, try not to drink while you're, you know, driving your machine. It is amazing, like, yeah. when you have these little machines. I love them. Haas has one that's really great, too, their little trainer. But just showing people, like, being visible yep. in public. It's an opportunity to talk to students and parents, other members of industry, and... Like I said, there's a yeah. lot of visibility on YouTube, but That's there's a lot of YouTube. So I'm talking like, let's get face to face. And if you have COVID, put your mask on. But like, let's actually get face to face and talk yeah. to people, <laughs> you know, show people like chips flying. So invite them to your shop. So more events where we can make it more visible instead of relying on them scrolling by, because we all know the algorithm's not gonna show the manufacturing content unless they're already watching manufacturing content. And let's start that conversation on what, what could it even look like? There could be schools out there, kind of like Cardinal near you, where they've already found great solutions for their communities. I wanna learn about all of it. I wanna talk about all of it, bring more awareness out there. So send Jenny a message if you know her, she'll get back to me, vice versa. I, yeah, let's keep the, the ball rolling and bringing more interesting projects like Jenny's done to the students out there because i think that's going to be the ticket giving them something in their day-to-days that they can use awesome well i am so grateful for all of the energy and the passion and all of the conversation and the experience that you bring jenny so so glad we connected and we made this possible thank you thanks for having me <laughs> and thanks everybody